A few months ago, we took you back to the Stone Age to meet the last of the cannibals, a tribe called the Korowai, who live in the jungles of West Papua, just as they did 10,000 years ago. They still believe in witchcraft, they still eat human flesh. It was an amazing experience for reporter Ben Fordham. So too was finding a frightened child named Wawa. Just a boy, but the Korowai are convinced he's possessed by evil spirits. For this, tribal law says he can be killed and eaten. No doubt you've heard quite a bit about Wawa in the last week. Now's the time to go back into the jungle for the truth. I went there 10 years ago, and because it was so dangerous, I only got to the edge of the territory. This time, I want to go deep into Korowai territory. Yeah, mana trapo. Paul Raphael is a man with a passion for lost tribes and black magic. And here's a spear that went there. He's a writer for the respected Smithsonian Museum. I'm looking for physical evidence of the cannibalism. I want to try and find the bones, the evidence that they actually do eat people. West Papua, just a few hundred kilometres north of Australia, but it could be a different planet. Snow-capped mountain ranges rich in gold and copper. And for its Indonesian rulers, the greatest prize of all, timber. Down there is the largest expanse of rainforest outside the Amazon. And that's where we're going. We've arrived at the edge of Korowai territory, the start of a 10-day round trip into the jungle. We've hired 15 Korowai porters to help carry our equipment. As for the rest of our expedition, there's me, a ring-in reporter for 60 minutes, thrown in the deep end. And 10-year-old Tony, a Korowai kid who heard we were coming and walked half a day to watch the plane land. Now he's decided he's coming along, whether we like it or not. And so begins a gruelling trek into the thickest, wettest, muddiest jungle on the planet. Building, and what are they making a bridge? <laughs> and our porters are Korowai. And some of them are even cannibals. We have some people who have actually eaten human flesh as our porters, yes. But they enjoy the taste, they say it's pretty good. Day two of our journey, and we're already among people who have turned their back against the outside world. That stone axe epitomises, sums up a whole epoch of humankind, millions and millions of years, when people use stone axes. Now, these are the, one of the last people in the world who are still and truly in the Stone Age. After two long days walking through the jungle, the track has literally come to an end. And the bad news for us is it ain't over. It's a long way from it. We've got two more days worth of travelling, and the locals tell us the only way to do it is by water, heading up the river. At times, the river's so shallow, everyone has to get out and push. As darkness falls, we're still on the river, and our troubles are just beginning. It's an ambush. 
We've got a frightening situation right here on the water at the moment. There's a tribe that's quite angry, armed with bows and arrows. They've come down to the shoreline and they're asking us to come onto the land. Do the boys think it could be a trap? It's another Korowai clan with a reputation for murder. They want money, the equivalent of about $50, and we're happy to pay. But our oarsmen are too terrified to paddle over. They think it's a trick. Finally, it's our 10-year-old hard man, Tony, who works out a deal. OK, well, I've got the money here if they want to come in. Yeah. Uh, and after a tense few minutes, leaders of the angry tribe arrive by canoe to collect their ransom. We just want to be peaceful, yeah? Okay. Yeah. 350. Mm -hmm. Okay. 350,000. We okay? Mano? Mano. And then they're gone. <laughs> they would have killed us. Good negotiating, huh? Man up. Day five, and we're back in the forest. We come upon a korowai with an axe made of steel and a heart made of stone. Bai Lum tells us how he killed one of his best friends. It's just normal. I don't feel sad or anything like that. And this is what Korowai cannibalism is all about. When a member of the tribe dies, the Korowai believe that person is a victim of black magic, struck down by some sort of evil spirit known as the Kakwa. What follows is a frightening witch hunt. Someone must be the Kakwa, and once the clan decides who it is, he will be killed and eaten. Remember, these are Stone Age people. They don't understand about microbes and germs and so on. So if someone dies mysteriously, it must have been the sorcerer, the Kakwa. And so that person's relatives go out and grab that person and pretty gruesomely kill him. This man you killed, did you know him before you killed him? Yes, he was my friend and he was part of my family. That night, Bai Lum arrives at our camp. He's carrying a black bag. Oh, God. What do you think of that? This is a, a man who was eaten by other humans, in fact, by the man who's sitting next to us. Take a look at that. Well, Bailum has come good on his promise. He's come to our village and shown us his greatest trophy, the skull of a human being. 12 months ago, Bailum's cousin died, but just before he died, he told him that this man, Bunop, was a sorcerer, a witch man. So he saw it as his duty to track him down and to kill him, to kill the Kakwa. First we cut off the head and then we start to slice open the stomach. We take out the intestines and then cut the ribs out of the side. Then we cut off the arms and legs. They eat everything except the teeth, the hair and the nails. Everything. It's now day seven. We're in completely unknown territory. We stumble upon a hunting party of Korowai men who insist we come to their village. We can go up? Yeah, yeah. They look, they look friendly, huh? Man up. Man up. Man up. Man up. 
looking around these astonished faces, it's clear they've never seen anything like us. Have you ever seen white people before, like, like us, with white skin? No, I've never seen a white people before. When we heard you were coming, I was thinking you were a ghost. The people were afraid, but when I met you, you are a human. It's the quest of a lifetime, and I've finally done it. i finally made that first contact. With, first contact with, with, with a clan that hasn't changed for 10,000 years. You know, we could be in a time machine. You know those science fiction movies? You get in the machine, you press 10,000 years, press a button, zap! You know, you, one moment later you open the door and here we are in a cannibal tribe in remote New Guinea 10,000 years ago. Imagine the enormity of that, huh? That's this moment we've got now. And that's why I've got tears in my eyes, I'm sorry. It must look like a whimper. <laughs> oh, hey, don't pull me pants down. <laughs> This was an unforgettable encounter. For us, a taste of what life was like at the dawn of humankind. She's holding on for dear life. For them, a visit from the future. They're as fascinated by us as we are by them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so hard to comprehend because these people are so generous, so open, so childlike in their innocence, yet they can turn so suddenly on their uncle, their brother, their father, anyone who they believe is evil, is a kakwa, and in a split second they can kill them and then eat them. And then, the most chilling moment of our journey. We find a little boy looking scared and confused. Wawa is six years old and he's been condemned to death. All because his mum and dad died suddenly. And the people in his village think that he is a sorcerer, he's evil. Uh, yeah, they're suspicious, Try starting suspicious that uh, these kids uh, become as a sorcerer. But Wawa's family and friends are determined to protect him. He's been brought here to safety to this village, a long way from the Kakwa killers. And our guide Cornelius has taken him under his wing. How old do the villagers wait until they would kill this boy? It could be like between starting from 15 years old, 16 years old. So at least he's safe for now. The villagers assured us this was the best place for him that Wawa would never be able to cope if he was suddenly taken out of the Stone Age and dropped into the 21st century. When he's a bit older, he can decide for himself whether to leave his people. I think as long as that he's staying with the family, as who the family is strong enough to protect him, he will be safe, I think. It wasn't easy saying goodbye to Wawa. But then, who are we to impose our ways, our ideas of what's right and what's wrong on the ancient Korowai? What about this poor little boy, Wawa? He's being protected in this village here, Yafufla, by a powerful section of his family. This is the toughest question I've ever faced and I've been thinking about it for many years. I mean, what do we do? Okay, we don't understand that they kill and eat each other, but to them that's very important at the very soul of their being. So my feeling, my desperate feeling, is that just let them be as they are because within 20 or 30 years, it'll be all over anyway. And just to let you know, we managed to get through to Cornelius this weekend and he assures us young Wawa is well and thriving 
with his extended family. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.